Hey, welcome to Calvary. I'm Torben and I volunteer on one of the worship teams here. We want this to be a place where you can come and worship, get to know God and connect with our community. If you're new here, we can't wait to get to know you. Feel free to message us on social media or text the word hello to 587-323-1199 and we'll respond right back. This is a great first step to joining our church family. We also want you to experience daily personal encounters with God, discipleship, and community. If you want to learn more about our culture here, deepen your relationship with God and find a small group that you can really connect with. We'd encourage you to talk with one of our volunteers or staff after the service. We want to let you know what's going to happen over the next hour. First, our band is going to lead us in worship that helps us understand who God is and express our love and affection towards Him. Afterwards, we're going to share some things about what's going on here at Calvary, and then one of our pastors will be sharing a message out of the book of Acts. I am so glad you're here. Now, I invite you to come and join us as we worship together. During China's Boxer Rebellion of 1900, insurgents captured a Christian mission station that was a school for Bible school students and for children of Christian missionaries. They block all the gates but one, and in front of that one gate, they place a cross flat on the ground. Then they pass word to the students inside the compound that any who trample the cross underfoot would be permitted their freedom and life. But anyone refusing would be shot. Terribly frightened, as you can imagine, the first seven students trample the cross under their feet and were allowed to go free. But the eighth student was a young girl. She refuses to reject Jesus and her faith in him. Kneeling beside the cross in prayer for strength, she arises and she moves carefully around the cross to go and face the firing squad. Strengthened by her example, every one, every single student of the 92 students remaining followed her example to, her de to their death. You know, by the mere fact of our surrender to, those of us who have done this or are choosing or thinking of doing this, and our identification with Jesus Christ, we can expect persecution. Jesus said in Mark 13, 13, Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Because of our founding fathers here in Canada and the Judeo-Christian values this country has been founded on, we haven't seen much persecution like massacre or exile because of our faith. But let me ask you, what will happen if the Canadian government labels the Bible as hate material and forbids it to be published? forbids it to be read, even carried in our possession or on our phones? What if they revoke a, a church's charitable status because they preach the Bible? What will happen if they eventually refuse public gatherings like this where the Bible can be preached? Will the church cease to exist? Will we just capitulate under the pressure and no longer uphold the Word of God? You see, in the short term... Persecution isn't something we look forward to. It threatens every aspect of our lifestyle that we have grown so accustomed to enjoy. Our comfort, our freedom, our safety, our security that we pride ourselves in, in this affluent society. But the historical reality is that Christianity has been under siege, under persecution since these days back here in the book of Acts. Persecution is the norm for a person who follows Jesus Christ, not the exception. Our experience here in North America is not consistent with so much of the world. And perhaps one day that the reality of that will change. Freedom of religion is under attack here in Canada. If we faithfully walk with Jesus... We need to be willing to grapple with and perhaps go through some level of persecution. 
And taking an eternal view will help us. The things of this world are, they're fleeting. Not only will we die if the Lord tarries, and we leave all our comforts behind, but the world itself will pass away. You see, Jesus had an eternal perspective on persecution. He says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, he says, Blessed are you when people insult you, when they persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, my dad used to tell me, he used to always say, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. And this is the way I would like us to look at this chapter here in Acts 4. Here in Acts 4. It's like a forewarning for everyone who will follow Jesus Christ that persecution is coming. And I trust that it will help forewarn us to know how to respond when that comes. What will be our response to whatever pressure the enemy brings to us? What has been your response so far? You know, two weeks ago, we looked at how the honeymoon phase is over for this young, budding, little new church community there in Jerusalem. The initial attack of, of Satan, the arch enemy of God, that he uses here in Acts is persecution of its leaders. Peter and John are arrested. They're thrown in jail and then dragged before the Sanhedrin, which was the Supreme Court of Israel at the time. They questioned them about their authority that they were healing in and then instructs them never to preach in the name of Jesus again. Peter and John, their response is compelling. And you can read that for yourself at the beginning of Acts chapter 4. We're not going to go through it now, or you can jump online off our website or perhaps Calvary's YouTube channel from January 7th. We studied that then. But when Peter and John are released, the story takes an interesting turn. Before we look at it, let's pray. Father, we thank you that we get to worship you like this in this country. We thank you for the freedom that we have to read your word, to publicly read your word, for the preaching, to share Christ with people around us. So God, I ask that you would manifest your presence here through your Holy Spirit. May you be honored, and may you use this word to strengthen us, to teach us, to give us understanding of an aspect of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. So word, may your word come alive for us now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to be following along on notes. If you have your notes, you can, pull them up, you can pull them out. If you don't have one, you would like a copy, you can just raise your hand, and an usher will bring you one now. The story takes an interesting turn here. And so Acts chapter 4, verse 23. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John run into isolation and stop talking about Jesus. Okay, not really. I was just seeing if you guys were awake. Peter and John returned to the other believers. Once released, the next thing, the very next thing that they do is counter this attack from the enemy through connecting in community. You know, my elementary school years were spent in a Christian school, much like Millwood's Christian School here in a small rural farming community in Minnesota. When I graduate from grade six, I know that I'm going into the public school system. And it was the world. I know that there will be many opportunities for me to make a choice. Will I follow Jesus and remain true to him, or will I be influenced by the rejection and the coming mockery of me and my faith? Will I follow the world in its lures, in its temptations, in its pleasures, in its thoughts, in its belief system, and in its values? I can remember in my 12-year-old 12 12 little mind determining that no matter what, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ. And while many of my friends from that Christian elementary school 
seem to walk away from their faith to fit into the culture of junior and senior high, I resist and I try to remain true. There were some that flat out reject me because of my faith. Others mocked me, including some teachers in front of everybody else. And as I think back, there were times that I stood for values that were really more about my Mennonite culture than they actually were about the Word of God. Sometimes I put my foot in my mouth. You know, I sure didn't get it right all the time. I crossed lines that, you know, I regret. But God seemed to honor this determination that was in my heart. And he used me many times through the opportunities for me to share my faith. But here's my point in sharing this with you. It is my family. It is my church family. And it was my school at the time that forewarned me about the pressures that I was about to face. And I believe they forearmed me to stand for Christ and to live my faith out no matter what. I was enabled to counter the enemy's attacks through my involvement in community. You see, some people think that you can live just fine as a Christian without being involved in church community. Well, Scripture begs to differ. Almost every book in the New Testament is written either to a young group of believers or that it's written to individuals who are connected into a church community. You see, our faith, and I want you to catch this, our faith is, certainly has a personal aspect to it, but it is not private. Our faith has a personal aspect to to it, but it is not private. God never designed us to follow Jesus Christ in isolation from everybody else who was on the same journey. Now, no church is perfect. People will hurt us, but that's why God includes so much instruction here on how to make relationships work even when we are wronged, even when we wrong other people. You see, when we go it alone, we're an easy target for the enemy. He can pick us off with temptation of all kinds. He can pick us off with false doctrine, twisting our beliefs and our perspectives on life. He'll even use our emotional brokenness that creates mental health issues and causes us to despair. Unhealthy, unhelpful patterns of relating that keep our relationships broken. See, the enemy doesn't have to worry about us much when we're not connected in community because he knows. Disconnected from church community, we'll make a mess of life on our own. He doesn't even need to help us much. Even the health community is recognizing the damaging aspects of loneliness not only on our mental health, but also literally in our bodies, in our physical health. And this is why our microchurches, this is why our small groups are so important to us and so critical to who we are as a church. It's the place where we connect to know others and be known by them. It's where we are loved and are loved by them, and we love others, and we're where we hold others accountable and they can hold us accountable. There is nothing like the strength of encouragement that comes when we are with people, when we know that we are not alone in the pressures that we're facing in our life. I invite you. Will you connect into community here? Either join up by joining a small group, perhaps joining a microchurch, maybe... God is calling you to start one. If so, come talk to us. We'll equip you, equip you, and we'll walk with you in that journey. These early believers here in Acts chapter 4, the church is only a few weeks old. They counter the enemy's attacks through connecting in community. They also did it through pursuing unity. Unity. 
Verse 23, as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voice, their voices together. Persecution because of faith drives those with that faith, drives them together into a tight-knit bond. It's a lot like, I often think of it a lot like marriage and parenting. Stick with me here for a minute. Problems in marriage are often minimized when parents have to, when parents have a particular challenge in front of them with one of their children. The challenging situation brings a sudden unity between the husband and wife, the mother and father, as they are now forced to solve this problem in front of them. Ever experienced this? The problem with this situation is when the challenge is dealt with, or the situation is now moving on, the issues of the marriage simply resurface. Sometimes families go from one crisis to another because it's the crisis that keeps their real issues beneath the, the, the surface of their life. And quite frankly, they would rather have it that way. It's one of the reasons. It's... No. The longer these issues stay beneath the surface, the harder it is to face them when they actually do surface. And so an unhealthy marriage relationship often never gets any better. And it's one of the ways that marriages blow out once the kids leave the house. The undealt with issues become so glaring, become so frustrating, so uncomfortable, it's easier to leave and find somebody else than to actually deal with those issues. What we need instead is to face the issues as they arise, or at least before they fester too long. I have sat with both, couples who have waited too long, and now it's too late. It seems hopeless. And I've sat with those couples who have stepped out to take a risk and said, we need help before it's too late. Which marriage do you think has the better chance of making it and honoring God? You know, if this is where you're at, can I encourage you, talk to your small group leader. Come talk to one of us. Seek help before it's too late. None of us are perfect. All of us are designed to walk through this kind of stuff in life with the real stuff in life in community and allow others to speak into our life, speak into our marriages and into our key relationships. So now back to our text. The church community today is not like the church in Acts they were only a few weeks old and didn't have the history of relationships that we often have here today. I don't think they had as much church hurt as many people do today. And might I say that many of us perhaps even have here today where the relationships have not been reconciled. Things have not been made right between us. So unity today is much like the journey of marriage and parenting in that if there are unresolved issues, unresolved relational issues between us and others in the body of Christ, yes, persecution may drive us together in unity causing the relational tension to fall into the background, to go underneath the surface again of our life. But it doesn't have to wait till then. God says, pursue unity now. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Paul is writing, he says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, 
making allowance for each other's fault because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace, so that, so, uh, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one glorious hope for the future. A.W. Tozer, not sure if you've heard of him. He's a theologian from the 50s and the 60s. He's, he wrote a book called The Pursuit of God, and in it he writes this. Has it ever occurred to you that 100 pianos all tuned to the same fork are automatically tuned to each other? They are of one accord by being tuned not to each other, but to an individual, another standard, which each one must individually bow. You see, persecution bound the early church believers together in unity because it caused them to focus their eyes, to fix their eyes on Jesus Christ tuning themselves to him instead of to each other. Now, let me speak to those of us who are following, already following Jesus. Keeping our eyes focused on him helps us be unified with other believers as well. Now, I know that we wound others. I have done that. We are also wounded by others. I have experienced that. But let's not allow our differences, and especially these wounds, to keep our hearts protected from others. We cannot violate truth or back down from it, but everything short of agreement on orthodox theology, those core beliefs that Scripture teaches... We can accept one another. And for many of us, we need to forgive one another and to bear with one another, especially those that we feel differences, annoyances. Let's keep our eyes focused on Jesus, pursuing the greater reward of unity and reconciliation. I don't want us to miss out on God's presence and his power that comes in the context of a unified body of Christ, a unified church. And we don't we need to wait for persecution for this to happen. Are you willing to determine in your heart today that you will do everything you can to maintain the unity of the Spirit with other believers? Is there something that you need to do this week to reconcile with a brother or sister in Christ? Have you felt wronged? Have you felt misjudged? Betrayed? Do you happen to know where you have mistreated somebody else? Do you need to go to them? Talk to them? Because you walked in slander. You spread some gossip about them, or perhaps you've judged them wrongly. By doing our part, which includes humility, it includes repentance and forgiveness, it includes seeking understanding as we try to understand who the other person is and why they've done what they've done, pursuing reconciliation. You know, there's no promise that this relationship is going to work well. In the end, because we can't control what the other person is going to say. We can't control how the other person will respond. But by doing everything we can to maintain unity in the body of Christ, God is honored by our choice and our heart to walk in that kind of humility and seek to honor Him. Whether that's here at Calvary or whether that's in some previous church that you've been a part of. We counter the enemy's attacks through pursuing unity together. Thirdly, 
Another way we do it is through prayer. I came across some prayers that kids have been overheard praying. So Alyssa, age seven, she prays, Dear God, please send a new baby for mommy. The new baby you sent last week cries too much. (laughs) Peter, age six, Dear God, who did you make smarter, boys or girls? My sister and I want to know. Kingston, age nine, prays, Dear God, please help me in school. I need help in spelling and adding and history, geography, writing. I don't need help in anything else. Bataya, age eight, is probably my favorite. She, says, she, she prays this. Dear God, this is my prayer. Could you please give my brother some brains? So far, he doesn't have any. <laughs> I love that. Well, let's look at how the disciples countered the enemy through prayer. Remember, they have just come back from spending time in prison and then being warned by the Supreme Court. Verse 24, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. O sovereign Lord, notice, they acknowledged right up front that there is no power, there is no authority, there is nothing that is higher than God. There is no situation. By addressing him as sovereign, they're reminding themselves and they're reminding us, quite frankly, that there is no situation, no problem, no crisis, no persecution that surprises God or that is bigger than what he can control. It's out of his control. They go on. Creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. You know, praise and thanks and worship are usually... Great places to start. There are times when we are in pits of despair and hopelessness. Our emotions are all over the place where maybe we can can approach God in the midst of that. We certainly can. But praise and thanks is usually a great way to approach the supreme God of the universe. Then, this is interesting, they remind God of what he has said and what, what has happened is consistent with his word. Verse 25, You spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, saying, Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. In fact, this has happened here in our very city. For Herod Antipas... Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and all the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you anointed. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your word. This is simply taking Scripture and praying it back to God. Speaking how his revelation is relevant to our situation. Now, it's not that God needs reminding He doesn't. But there is power in speaking out his word back to him. Isaiah 55. I'm not going to read it here today, but it's a great place. That reference is in your notes. You can go read that for yourself. Praying scripture is one of the most effective ways to see God's power work on our behalf, in our relationships, and in the world around us. We are seeing that here in this church, and we are seeing that here in the school, in our relationship with them. Let's keep going. Then they ask, they make a bold ask. Verse 29. And now, O Lord, hear our threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Notice, the disciples don't cower. They don't back down in fear. In the face of opposition and threats, the early church didn't stop praying. They stepped up their praying. This is what I think is so cool. They launch a counterattack. You know, this persecution honed their focus. It helped clarify their priorities. It stoked their passion. And so they go after the objectives of the kingdom. 
It wasn't, oh, please, God, help them stop persecuting me. Oh, may they stop laughing at me. But, Lord, demonstrate your power through us now. Give us boldness and courage for us to speak even more with more clarity and greater boldness than what we did before. It's like they're saying to the Supreme Court, you're going to try to stop this gospel? Well, just watch what God does through us when we speak his name again and we share the reality and the power of what God is doing in us with the, power, with the, with the people around us. You wait and see what God's going to do. This is spirit-led audacious prayer. Is that how you and me respond when we're faced with some of these things? A little bit of social discomfort because I just, do I speak about Jesus or not? You know, James 4, 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. In the face of persecution or ridicule or social discomfort, what rises up within us? I can tell you, fear rises up in me. Self-pity, is that what comes up inside of you? Victim spirit? You know, all of these may be true, but remember that there is no need for courage if fear doesn't exist. Courage gives us what we need to go through the fear, to rise above the fear and do what God is calling us to do. Courage rises above fear. And this prayer is the disciples' courageous response in the midst of persecution. It's a determination to see God work even more powerfully. Will we determine in our own heart today that this is how we will respond? Let this forewarning of persecution forearm us to fortify our spirit and say, yes, Lord Jesus, when that time comes to get us ready. Even Jesus said, John 15, 16, you didn't choose me. I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask when you use my name. What will you be asking for in prayer next time you face possible persecution? In fact, we don't even have to wait until we're facing that. We could be praying a prayer like this now. The disciples were persecuted because they were going after things in the kingdom. God, the Father's objective, his primary concern is to reconcile people to himself. Reconcile you and me to himself. And if you are here today and you are not following Jesus, this is a decision that you, you're here because you're trying to figure this thing out. Can I just affirm to you that your heavenly Father's desire is to reconcile you back together with him? He's not sitting here wagging a big finger in your face. He's not saying you got to get your life perfect before coming to him. His desire is for you to come now just as you are. He loves you exactly the way you are. Now, he loves you too much to leave you that way, but that's coming in the future. He accepts you and will take you today. Will you surrender your life to him? For those of us that do follow Jesus Christ, are we in the business of what the God the Father is doing? Or are we too busy? Or are we too preoccupied with many other things? Now, you might say, well, I'm not a pastor. This kind of stuff does not come very easy. I'm not a missionary. But God has placed you. He has placed you in your home. He has placed you in your community, in your place of work, in your school, with your colleagues, with that boss, because he wants to use you in your personality, 
in how he's uniquely wired you to share Jesus Christ with them. Are you going to speak about him? You know, is it possible that maybe you and I haven't experienced much persecution because we're not seeking to reconnect people with our Heavenly Father? We've actually never said, we've never allowed Jesus, the word Jesus, to, to pass our lips at work or in the classroom. Maybe we've gotten so distracted, we're just simply not doing anything with Jesus. And so the enemy doesn't have to persecute us. A key strategy in countering the enemy is prayer. Because even if that is where we are at today, that can change by us simply asking God to change your heart and to give us the courage that we need. Lastly, from this text, we counter the enemy's attacks with a filling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 31. After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Notice that God's presence here and, uh, and demonstration of his power, it didn't come until after they had prayed, after they made a big ask. See, an experience of God's presence isn't something that we can necessarily control. We can lean into community. We can respond in unity and counter with prayer. But a sense of God's presence and power and his power comes as a result of these things. Like for the disciples that day, it wasn't something that they could manufacture, couldn't manipulate God to do this. They simply responded to God and because he was honored, he showed up in power. Perhaps you ask, on a bit of a different note, well, why were they filled with the Holy Spirit? Didn't they already have that in Acts chapter 2, which would have been a number of weeks, only a few weeks before this? Well, here, they're filled again because they leak. I like to think of us as a cup. This once I was preaching, and I was having struggle with my voice. One of the ushers thankfully brought me a cup of water. I take a drink, and I set it down right here beside my notes, and, and then carry on preaching. Well, after a few minutes, I look down, and this whole side of the table is covered in water. It wasn't running off the table yet, but all my notes soaked. The cup had a leak, and like the cup... Sin and brokenness and wounding creates holes within us. Now, we're not going to lose the Holy Spirit completely, those of us who follow Jesus Christ, but we leak the Holy Spirit. And so we need many fillings throughout our lifetime for effectiveness. In fact, I would say we need his filling every time we have an opportunity in front of us. And I believe he'll give it to us when we need it. He's promised that. Ephesians 5.18 gives us this imperative. It says, be filled, Paul says, with the Holy Spirit. To be said another way that is more consistent with the Greek, as you go, be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. This, the apostles had just endured a time of intense questioning and persecution. I imagine they were tired. They were weary from the pressure and the imprisonment. The believers there needed a fresh filling because they started asking a whole lot of questions that they had never probably even thought of before until Peter and John were thrown in prison. They needed this fresh filling of the Holy Spirit to give them the courage to stand strong in their faith and boldly share about the reality and the power of Jesus Christ in their life so that they wouldn't just chicken out like we looked at a couple weeks ago. If you've ever experienced a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, you know, there is this boldness, this sense of confidence and, 
And courage is one of the effects of it. But it also comes in other forms. There may be a buoyancy in your spirit. There might be a deep sense of peace and joy that is, that is inexpressible, but it's overwhelming. There could be energy for life. There can be a hunger and a thirst for the word, to know the word. It can be, there can be physical kind of sensations of warmth and tingles and a sense of light shining all around us. You know, even this fresh sense of boldness that we talked about. With new challenges, with new trials and opportunities, we need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit to empower us to face these challenges and continue to share Christ. You know, Jesus said, Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. This filling is essential because we have been given a divine commission to proclaim a divine message for a divine ministry. And therefore, we have... We need divine power to fulfill this divine purpose. I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you make. I don't care what your position in society is. Every one of us need the Holy Spirit. We can't do this in our own strength. The boldness that is given by the Holy Spirit is intended to enable us to share with grace, love, sincerity, conviction. It's a freedom that is free of terror. Or I should say it's not bound by terror or free fear. It is not concerned with people's reaction. It's not concerned about their opinion or their threat of harm in this case. So four ways that we can counter the enemy that we've seen here in Acts chapter 4 is through connecting in community, pursuing unity, praying audacious prayers, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Which one of these have you been doing really well in? Which one's worked well? Which of these haven't you even thought of and maybe need to start working on in your life and seeking God for? You know, like the little girl who paused, prayed, and then courageously walks around the cross to her death, do you desire this kind of courage that these apostles had back then? Are you willing? Do you desire to pray this prayer for yourself? If so, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. Why don't we stand together? Here's the prayer. Why don't you just read it quietly to get, um, alone to determine in your heart one more time. Okay, this is what I want. And if so, in just a minute, we're going to read it out loud. And listen, there's, there's no pressure to do this. If this is not where your heart is, you know what, then I'd, I'd, I'd say probably don't, don't pray something that you don't mean. If this is where your heart is, and your heart, you're, you're crying out inside going, okay, God, yes, walk with me. Give me what I need here. Then let's pray this together out loud. Here we go. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Amen. Let's worship together.